In life, we have moments of time to tell someone how we feel is true. The truth is we have that moment every second of the day we interact with another human being. But many of us pretend that we're interacting with people, but we're really just talking to them through our cell phones. We're either on the telephone under a federally protected phone line, or we're on social media, which is utilizing a federally protected phone line. The truth is that the wiretapping of old Nixon era is no longer reliable or viable in today's world is true, but technologically it's much simpler and easier to do. In life we have people who like to steal information and people who like to violate rights and people who like to get into gaming on people's lives. I don't talk about this to make jest or light of the fact that theft goes on. Identity theft is a huge topic in the news every few weeks or every few months and that's great but it doesn't really practically tell how a person can solve the problem. Because cybercrime is one of those things that's an invisible crime. It's hard to literally see who's doing what. Stalking, on the other hand, and violating a person's bags or property or clothing or stealing those things from them and stealing items from their car, their pockets, their houses, or other places that they own or rent is sort of ill will. Yet, it still goes on. And the question is, why? Maybe it's because people are ill, mentally ill physically ill, or somehow off track in their cellular health. Maybe it's because they have a psychological defect that they haven't learned that their rights do not belong to someone else, or literally that other people's rights do not belong to them. When I talk like this, I'm trying to talk practical about the things going on in my life. That for now, three to four years, I've had someone sort of pilfering from me, literally destroying property, destroying religious items that go on my altar, getting into my luggage as I travel, getting into my car when I still had that before it was taken an impound and openly then sold by that company because someone apparently allegedly told them they had the right to do that. And that was sort of ill will because it was a fully paid for automobile and it did get me from A to Z, but it wasn't the best gas mileage for sure after having to pay it to be overhauled because the first time around it was a lemon. And yet we don't have lemon laws in Indiana, but that's another story for another day. We have to protect our rights. Our rights are our personhood, meaning that of our body, our paperwork, meaning that of our legal documentation, from banking to medical health to mental health to anything to do with mortgages or residences, etc., as well as our possessions and our property, the things that we've received as gifts from people that love us, the things that we've traveled and found along the road, things we purchased to decorate our homes, anything in that realm belongs to us. And yet there are people who lie to themselves about their right to take those things. Their right to open a locked door or an unlocked door and literally walk in and say, I think I'll have that, as if it's a free shopping spree for me, meaning them, in that moment of time. What I'm talking about, of course, are federal laws. The U.S. Constitution was built on these very constructs that long, long ago, kings and queens of England would go in and literally rob people of their wealth and commandeer it in a way that was ill will. We also have the stories of Nazi Germany where mentally unwell physicians were treating the mentally well with ill will. They were doing experiments on them. They were running them in plays. They were testing their prowess. They were testing their abilities. They were doing all sorts of things unbeknownst to some of them and beknownst to others. The reality is that those war crimes have been tried, and yet there are still monsters in the land who think they have the right to take away another person's internationally protected under U.S. federal if you will, treaties, and I'll probably get the language wrong, but openly our treaties are things that all citizens of our states need to follow. In life, we only have a few moments of time to make a difference for someone, and how we practically make a difference for that individual is to simply say, what are your goals for today? What are your goals for this week? Or what you got coming up this month that I can help with in some way? Or do you have a plan for the next year or perhaps the next five years is what my father would always talk about. Of Where do you want to be in five years, son? Well, that was sort of tough to anticipate when I was still dealing with the day-to-day -day crunches of life. In life, we have moments of time to prove who we are in God's house. is something I like to talk about because we are all liable to the God in heaven if we believe in them, of course, and openly if we have a spirituality at all or a practice of faith, we are openly told that we eventually go to heaven. But what goes to heaven practically? Is it our physical being? And the answer is practically no. We've not seen that. We don't see souls lifted up that way. But it is our soul, actually, that goes to heaven. And we slip through the stream, the silver lining, if you will, of our cerebral cortex. And we go into the other, the nether regions, the other lands, 
the other spirit world. And if you don't know about that, maybe you've not read enough story about the people who've died and come back. As someone who started to slip through and said, I'm not done loving that girl yet, that was sort of enough for the Grim Reaper to leave me be. But it has also put me at risk to a lot of other things, and that I have more gifts these days is probably true. But I've also practiced my faith a lot deeper, a lot with more uh, servitude in a way, but a lot more humility than I ever did before. Because I know what it's like to personally be folded in half by the Lord in heaven and his angels. And I've had it physically done to me. But if I say that to anyone, they'll think, oh, mentally off his rocker. He doesn't know what the hell he's talking about. But that's not true. When you feel a force, physically knock your little bottom to the floor in a Panera because all you want to do is run out and tell the woman you love, I am madly in love with you. Please marry me. And the Lord says, not now. She can't handle it. And you're like, I am not waiting one more second. And God's like, no, this is my plan for your life, not yours. Whack. Now, I can make a comedy out of the whole thing, but it really did happen to me. It wasn't a perspective, as a mental health therapist might say, my perspective of what happened. No, literally, I physically felt a force pushing me to the floor that said, you will not go at this time. She has not learned to tame her shrew. Now, openly, when I talk about the taming of the shrew, of course, I'm talking about the lovely film with Elizabeth um, Taylor and one of her husbands at the time, I believe, and I believe his name was Burton. But at that, that moment in time, it was an amazing film. It's still a great flick to watch. But it's literally about a vehemently vain woman who just thought she should marry someone different. But she was such a monster in her soul that she couldn't get the right partners to pay attention to her. And all the man did really was take her home after being she was betrothed him, unbeknownst to her happiness, and literally make love to her in her soul. Tell her how beautiful she was, tell her how great she was, tell her all those things, but practically that didn't do it. It was the taming of her that did it. It was a taming to say, you will submit to me because I am your Lord and Master in this home. I pay the bills in this house. But we don't do that anymore. We have equal relationships with men and women today. And I really wanted a girl who was fully equal to me. I had a loving spouse of a long time who was a great partner, and I really loved her, and I wanted to grow old with her, and my bilingual family was expected to go on a long time. But that didn't work out. There was a decision she made that she wanted to go, and there was a prayer I made that sort of said, if it's not right anymore, Lord, if there's someone better for me, then please, by all means, let it be her decision. And in year 19 and 20, that sort of happened. Now, if I share that truth, if I literally share that honest truth, that I just wanted to be sure that this was the right one for me, it feels bad because literally she was the right one for me during that period of my life. But in this period of my life, there's some other people who are better for me. There's practically a girl that the Lord has planned for me my entire life. And I now know this because as I look back over the course of my life, I see all the signs to her, her name, her initials, her everything that are even shown to me even as of today. That I can be walking someplace and you can hear that little voice going, hey, look over there, check it out. Heh <laughs> And it's sort of a game with God, because he's like, you think I don't know anything about the, my own world, but let me show you this. And that is the magic of Jesus. That the magic of Jesus knows where every human being is practically on the planet. That twice with my own soulmate, I literally ended up face to face with her in my vehicle versus her vehicle on two roads. And that loving woman, Karen, just didn't get it that God put me there. I don't travel with GPS the way that most people do. I don't use a phone to get places. I literally let get God lead me. And boom, I was put right in front of her twice to find out what she's like, perhaps, to figure out where she was in her relationships, perhaps. But openly, I still miss her soul. In terms of the other woman that I madly love, in terms of her life, the same thing has happened. I have demanded to the Lord on several occasions, I want to see my love. And openly, he'll put me right there, right there at that moment of time. And I just listened to him saying, okay, now go, now go over, go over to the post office now. And if you wouldn't mind, if you would please look to the left, boom. Or when I was walking in Target, the most beautiful experience I'd had in a long time. That he had asked me to spend the whole day shopping and looking at product and seeing what was good product for my future home and my future life that the Lord has planned for me. And openly said, okay, I want you to go south in the building now towards the exit and I want you to turn right. And I probably have told this story many times, but I'm going to tell it again. And he said, now look, doesn't the Lord keep his promises to you? And I saw the loveliest face behind glasses, pushing a cart, holding a cell phone. And I just said, oh my God, there's my love right there. And I said, Lord, what do I do? 
and the distinct voice that I heard was, walk by, please. We know it's hard for you. Walk by. We know you want to run to her and tell her how much you love her, but you've got to walk by tonight. It was later in the evening that I realized why they wanted me to walk by, because it is my role, my job in life, to make sure the ones I love are protected the most. Sometimes that means disparaging them. Sometimes it means rejecting them. Sometimes it means stay away from me to protect them from the monsters who are attacking my life. Sometimes it means putting them in their place to say, you're off God's path in this. You don't understand half of what I've learned because I've submitted all to the Lord. Now, clearly this isn't a news reporting type of video. This is a sort of pastoral tout of his life and his story. But in your life, you have moments of time like that too. The only question is, do you have as many as I do? Or do you have less than I do? Or do you have more than I do? I wish there was a forum, a place that we could talk about our experiences of faith and the loving Jesus in the world and the way that God, Heavenly Father, and Divine Mother do things for us that just go, wow, what an amazing architectural divine being there is in this land. You see, those were the reasons that our forefathers came to America, to develop a new land, to find a place where they could worship the Lord in the way they chose, and openly, it's our right to do so. There are plenty of people in the psychology realm that don't want to believe in a God because it takes away their power to harm a person's life. It also takes away their power to mark people mentally unwell. And I hate to tell you this, God made everyone. What if God made people in a certain way to push other people to do better in life? What if birth defects do occur that cause certain mental problems? It is true. Physical ailments certainly occur all the time and we don't give them enough regard is absolute truth. Our sidewalks throughout Indianapolis are crap. Our roads, except for college perhaps, and maybe Meridian, and possibly even Keystone, are literally broken down. Where do the billions of dollars go? If we're building another football stadium, we don't need it. What we need is politicians to pay attention to the roads, because the roads give us our travel capabilities, not only in terms of walking, but in terms of our exercise and running, but also in terms of the elderly who need to get out and about with their wheelchairs, with their walkers, with their rollators, and live life to the fullest to the very ends of their life. And practically, so many sidewalks run out that an elderly person would just probably panic to find that there's no street, there's no sidewalk, because in their day and age, there was always a sidewalk. But we've got cities and towns that have sidewalks that sort of run out, or they run into these dead-end stoplights, or they run into trees. And that happens all over the place in Fishers and across the border as we try to go towards Carmel. And now they're putting in all these roundabouts that sort of ruin a walker's capability of getting across the road safely. Fortunately, the other day I had a shuttle uh, that I borrowed from one of the great dealers of Carmel who was lovingly kind enough to say, we'll get you across the road with all your pack, don't worry. What a great community service they provided. Do you think I'm going to not buy a vehicle there? Hell yes, I'm going back there to buy my next car. I don't care. Why? Because they showed me kindness. They showed me care in a time of difficulty. Whether it was a simple difficulty for them to solve, it doesn't matter. The fact is, they could have been like the guy next door who said, sorry, can't do that. We don't have any of those shuttles here. And they're both sitting on the lot. So he's sitting there lying to me while they're right there on the lot. So in life, we have moments of time to show people who we are. We have moments of time to talk about God's blessings, God's promises, and God's predictions somewhat. But in life, when we're not with God's path, we're not hearing as well, we're not doing as well in our life, we're not performing as well, well, and in my life, despite the fact that I'm in abject poverty, I'm being crapped on all the time by police officers and literally other people who they get as liaison to find out information and do stuff for I don't know what reason, because they sort of feel like it, I guess, or it's a fun game for them, or it allows them to practice their personal interest capability because we really don't have that many monsters in Indianapolis. I don't know. But the reality is that in life, we have moments to show who we are in front of God's house. And the magic of Jesus is beyond compare. There will be never a time in my life when I doubt where I'm headed, where I'm going to go, or how I'm going to get there when it's time for me to go. And for those of you of faith, know what I mean by that. In life, we have moments of time to prove to people there's an energetic force like in Star Wars that can move you, can save you, can move that car back on the road when it slips in winter. But if you don't love it enough, if you don't honor him enough, if you don't appreciate God enough, if you don't thank him enough, if you don't get on your knees every day to say, Lord, what do you have of my life? What am I supposed to learn from this lesson? Then you just might be stuck forever in adolescent land, and that'll be annoying as heck to anybody who loves you. Because everyone wants to talk with the most intelligent people in the world is not the case. 
that people want mature relationships in their life is absolutely the case. In life, we have moments of time to talk about things that are important. My audio cast that might be focused on me way too much, but openly as an old-time reporter trained from Indiana University, the stories I'd love to tell most people won't believe. I've tested them. People just looked at me like he's out to lunch. And it's not true. Factually, it's happened to every single thing. So in life, we can either believe that real crazy things happen to people, or we can mark everybody unwell and say, well, maybe everybody's a little bit unwell. But the truth is, being unwell is better than being dead. So in life, when we're looking for how to produce a life worth living, whether we're in abject poverty, like many people downtown in Indianapolis, or whether we're swinging in success and significance, as Dr. John Maxwell says about his survival security and significance modes of wealth development, that practically in life, we only have a few moments of time to be something powerful to someone else. The power of touch, the power of a hug, the power of forgiveness, the power of a kiss, literally the power of making love to a person's soul is really what life is about. Thanks for listening.